So yes, uh, as Brian said, my name is Steve Dykstra. Uh, and uh, today uh, I'm pleased to uh, be sharing my work with you and determining the timing and magnitude of river discharge events for shellfish closures. Uh, so before I uh, rush into things, I just want to first of all, thank uh, the FDA, um, as well as all of those who are involved in uh, the Dissel FDA Fellowship uh, for their efforts and making, making this possible uh, for me to, to uh, do my work, uh, which I'm sharing here. And in particular, uh, uh, my advisors on this, uh, Brian Zonkowski and Kevin Kelsey uh, for their efforts. So uh, let's see. So, uh, <clears throat> so in my fellowship uh, work, I uh, have identified uh, a, a few different problems that, that we have um, uh, <clears throat> with, with uh, shellfish, shell fisheries. Uh, in particular, uh, when, when uh, high, high river discharge events are occurring, uh, they transport uh, fecal pollution downstream and these, these uh, uh, fisheries have to be closed uh, during this time. And uh, determining uh, when they are closed has become, or is, 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 a, is, is a difficult matter and uh, could use uh, some improvement. Uh, and uh, this is particularly difficult because uh, measuring discharge uh, from rivers uh, on the coastal environment uh, is no simple task. Uh, and so this, this has uh, led us uh, to ask uh, how, how can coastal discharge be accurately estimated and predicted for shellfish closures to ensure food safety. So as we think about this uh, transitional environment uh, from uh, rivers or land uh, inland, uh, is my mouse visible? Maybe not. Uh, so starting uh, further inland, uh, uh, we have um, rivers and land on the right side here, and we have the sea on the left side along this transitional region. And uh, the solid line here is the Earth's surface. And so, so the uh, uh, in the middle here, we have a bay and a delta along this transition. And then you can also see where the channel bed goes up below the surface there. Uh, as we uh, fill in the water uh, in here, uh, we can see that, that the flow across the system is uh, unidirectional uh, near the land, and then it becomes bidirectional uh, further seaward uh, due to the ebbing and flooding of tides. And then along this gradient, we also have uh, a transition in vegetation, whereby it is predominantly forested inland uh, in these uh, temperate systems. Uh, as, as I've been looking at predominantly and uh, are predominantly um, on the coasts in the US. Uh, and then further seaward, uh, we have uh, grasses or, or I should say maybe uh, illegal hailing marshes. And then further seaward, the substrate uh, is usually bare. Uh, and then uh, along, al along the transition, we have a profile uh, that, that ends up uh, creating a backwater effect whereby uh, the, the bed diverges from the surface of the water. And this, this ends up increasing the surface, or it ends up increasing the cross-sectional area of the, uh, of, of the flow and it slows it down. <clears throat> uh, so, 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 so then further seaward of these backwater regions and the bi-directional flow uh, or the, the changes in, into bi-directional bi, bi flow are uh, where, where oysters are predominantly grown. Uh, and uh, be between, between the area, areas of interest where oysters are and uh, uh, where discharge can be measured far inland, uh, where we have normal flow is, is quite a long, complicated transition uh, that occurs. And so, so as we uh, think about these uh, transitional environments, uh, we usually think about them uh, longitudinally. Uh, so thinking just river to sea, 
but uh, uh, there's, there's, there's other aspects to this that we need to consider. So if we just think about like the Mississippi River uh, coming down here on this figure to the right, uh, that, that is just simply longitudinal. But then uh, as the water uh, may rise here, we have a change in the vertical. And, and, and the water may rise uh, a bit and may end up going through, uh, through gaps in the levees uh, that line the river. And these gaps are called crevasses. Uh, and, and then this flow may go into uh, a delta plain or a back swamp area. Uh, and then at, at higher flow, uh, the water may go over top of the levees and connect directly to the backwater or to, to the, to the uh, back swamp regions there. So we have vertical and lateral aspects that we also have to consider in this process. And so as, uh, as, as the discharge events themselves begin to move, to move downstream, they usually rise first from precipitation inland before rising later downstream. And so we can, we can describe this as a propagating wave that moves downstream, uh, like you can see in this little animation uh, in the lower left there. And uh, the waves move along a water level gradient and due to the changes in uh, geometry uh, of the system, we can have uh, lateral and vertical changes as well that occur to the waves propagating seaward. So this brings us back to, uh, to, to, to the question that we have. Uh, and, 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 and I think with this, we can then provide a decent hypothesis, which is that coastal discharge can be accurately estimated by observing river flood waves. Uh, across the system. And we can use these uh, 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 to try to build a simple um, uh, analytical model uh, to describe uh, how, these, how these flood waves are propagating. So, so the, the objectives uh, of this fellowship have been one, uh, two, to observe the river flood waves uh, as they're propagating both um, uh, in terms of magnitude and discharge, and then also to identify uh, how um, how they change uh, along along the system, both spatially and uh, temporally, uh, over the past or particularly over the past century, where we do have good 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 discharge records. And then, uh, lastly, is to develop to develop a, a model. Um, from this work uh, that can be used to then predict uh, discharge and fecal coliform. Uh, so the first, the first half of the objectives uh, have now been complete and uh, we have uh, published this work, uh, Brian and I, in uh, Water, Water Resources Research, uh, which came out uh, earlier this year. And so today I am going to be sharing a snapshot of of this work with you, uh, which so the methods uh, that we used in this work uh, were predominantly long-term observations and uh, wave theory, and additionally momentum balances. But we'll focus on the first two for now. And uh, with this work, we uh, we used uh, our coastal system here in Alabama as uh, as our test bed for this work. And, and, uh, and uh, the, the fluvial marine transition here begins actually far inland uh, where the dams are. So uh, on, on the Tom Bigby and the Alabama rivers, uh, far inland. So it's about uh, 238 kilometers uh, if you travel by water uh, to reach these sites. So this is where the tides stop during uh, low discharge periods. And then as the water flows seaward, uh, the rivers enter a large, large delta system. Uh, this, the delta here is, uh, is actually a little bit larger than Mobile Bay itself. And uh, within, within the delta, the rivers confluence and come together. And then uh, the water, or the, the stream then, then by, by, by uh, Fearcates into the Mobile 
distributary and the Tensaw. Uh, we, we will focus on the Mobile distributary for today. Uh, and then uh, it moves through an ecotone uh, where we have, we have uh, illegal hailing marsh down by the Delta, uh, or the, 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 the end of the Delta by the Bayhead. which is where our area of interest is with oysters um, or o o oyster farms there, like in the, uh, the lower right picture. Uh, so, so then uh, using this uh, work, we can, we can then uh, pull together uh, some of the long-term observations and uh, the, um, uh, sorry, the, the the uh, long-term observations and and uh, measurements of, of the system to first look at the geometry. Uh, so the longitudinal change from the from the Gulf all the way to to the dams, uh, when we look at the vertical, uh, is 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 actually quite a uh, variable. So starting in the bay here, we have a fairly deep uh, area uh, across the channel, which is, which is the solid line here, but the bay itself is quite, is quite a bit shallower. Uh, so I've kind of separated that out uh, at, at about three meters. But then as we move further seaward, uh, we have uh, our, our deepest region roughly in the middle of the delta, and then it becomes shallower further uh, landward. Uh, then if we put the water levels on there, we can see that there's uh, some variability, particularly far inland. And then if we take the slope across the delta, uh, we see that we have, have a backwater uh, region there that, that then extends uh, further inland uh, when we estimate what the backwater length uh, of the system is, which roughly extends to where the dams are located. Uh, lastly, uh, drawdown that occurs uh, where the profile uh, of the water ends up uh, dipping down uh, is much shorter and we'll get, we'll get more into drawdown a little bit further in. So as the water itself moves across this transitional environment, uh, it's, uh, it can be highly variable throughout the year and uh, and, and has uh, quite a few large events that have occurred over time. Uh, so looking at this thin line up top, this is the maximum observed water levels uh, for any given day of the year. And the thin line on the bottom is the minimum flow. And so we can see that discharge ranges over three orders of magnitude uh, coming into the system. And we have uh, quite a few large events as well, uh, which make it a good uh, test site. Uh, as, as the events uh, are propagating into the system, we can identify them with our water level measurements. Uh, so I've highlighted five different uh, locations here on the, um, on, the, on the map on the left, uh, where the star colors coordinate with the colors of the water levels. Uh, on this time series here on the right. And, um, and we can generally see that, that the discharge uh, uh, peaks uh, before the peak at water levels, or sorry, the discharge is measured inland at the dams peaks before the peak water levels. And, and, and then as we go further, further seaward, uh, the peak water levels occur sequentially later. Additionally, the water levels get smaller, uh, or the peak water levels get smaller as we move further seaward. So we can see that we have both a lag time that occurs and we have attenuation uh, of the wave as it moves downstream, uh, which I think is quite exciting to be able to actually just see that in the observational data uh, clearly. So if we uh, look, at, look at some static water levels across the system, 
uh, looking longitudinally uh, here from the arrows. Uh, and we put, we put the longitudinal gradient on one axis, and then we put the water levels on uh, the, the vertical axis here. Uh, and then on a third axis, we have discharge. And so uh, in, this, in this figure, uh, each one of these ribbons uh, represents uh, 1,000 1, cubic meters per second of flow. Uh, and each ribbon covers, covers the, in, the entire transitional region. Uh, so, so if we look at it, for example, uh, at, uh, at a low discharge, here it's fairly flat uh, across the system. It's fairly low, and we don't have a whole lot of change. So the flatness or the slope of, of it, uh, we can see with the color. So the blue is the, it, it indicates there that the slope is very, it's very low. Uh, and then as the discharge increases, we both have an increase in water level, particularly inland, and we have an increase in slope that also occurs. Uh, and, and then uh, just to kind of uh, put this into perspective, uh, I, I uh, overlaid a plane on here of uh, the delta elevation, which is kind of this uh, clear translucent brownish color. And so we can see that the water levels end up rising uh, above the delta plane uh, as, as the discharge increases. Uh, so, um, so if we look particularly at the delta uh, in regards to the slope, the upper delta is usually steeper than the lower delta. Uh, but, um, but at really high discharge, uh, this actually switches and the lower delta ends up becoming steeper than the upper delta, which is kind of opposite of, of uh, what we, what we may, 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 may expect. Uh, and so this can be uh, better uh, identified by just simply looking at it in terms of it transitioning from a concave to a convex uh, profile. Uh, so we have, have, a, have a quite a dramatic change uh, from, from low discharge to high discharge, which ends up completely changing all, all of the flow hydraulics uh, across the delta system uh, and is, is quite counterintuitive at times. Uh, <clears throat> so, 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 so then looking at how the water levels change, uh, in terms of the waves propagating through across uh, the lag time or, or across the system, uh, we can then measure or pull together and average out the data uh, for the lag times across the system. So each one of these little hash marks here represents where a station is located uh, along the longitudinal gradient. Um, and then uh, the x-axis is the discharge. And so uh, as the discharge increases, we generally see the colors becoming more blue. So this ends up, or this, this, this indicates that the lag time is getting shorter. Well, the shorter lag time also means that the wave is getting faster. So as discharge is increasing, uh, the wave is getting faster, which, 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 is, which is kind of what we would expect except at high discharge, uh, this actually becomes inverse and, and the, the lag time actually ends up becoming longer as discharge increases. So the wave ends up slowing down. <clears throat> uh, and then when we look at uh, the, the, the velocity, the time to peak velocity, it ends up following a fairly similar trend. Uh, uh, as as the water level, and but then we we can actually break this down a little bit further, and and which was a, a little bit of a surprise to me is that is 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 that right at the at at the fastest flow uh, is approximately where the flow began to go out out or where where flow began to move out of the channel and, and, uh, and uh, into the crevasses, uh, um, and then, then on onto the floodplains. So, 
so, so, so then if we just simply think about it in terms of flow that's confined to the channel, well, the flow, the flow that's confined to the channel causes, or as, as, as this charge increases, it causes the wave to move faster downstream. But then as the flow is, is moving out onto the floodplain, uh, the loss of water causes it to take more time to move downstream. And then once the, once the floodplains are basically full and we have flow that goes over top of the, uh, of the levees, uh, we, end up, we end up seeing a, a fairly consistent uh, lag times and not a whole lot of change as discharge increases. So if we then uh, just to highlight uh, one station and compare the water level and velocity uh, across this, we can see in this uh, low, lowest figure down or lowest subplot down here, uh, where, the, where the blue is water level and the red is velocity, uh, the, the velocity ends up occurring uh, on average or rough, 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 roughly about um, one to two days before, before peak. Uh, water level uh, in the system. Uh, and so if you want to know more about the, the wave phasing and dynamics and all that, feel free to ask me. Um, I love to talk about that. Uh, but for now, we'll move into uh, the discussion um, aspects of this, of this work and trying to bring it together. So uh, at, at uh, low discharge uh, conditions, uh, we generally have flow confined to the channel. And this, this flow that's confined to the channel is dominated by, by backwater dynamics and the slowing of flow, um, generally downstream. Uh, and this allows for the marine influences to move far inland, thus the, way, uh, the, the tides reach, reaching the dams um, far inland. Uh, but then at, at a high discharge conditions, we have flow that goes over the levees. And, uh, and uh, when the flow is, is over the levees, uh, the, uh, the forest along, along the delta plain actually acts uh, as, a, as, as a frictional restriction to the water. And so as the water, as, as, the, as the flow through the, through, through, through the delta um, ends up increasing, the forest uh, continues to add, to add, add, add more friction to it. And this ends up causing the water levels to continue to rise more. Well, further, further downstream where the flow moves over top of, of uh, the, the grasses, uh, the grasses bend over. And, um, and so the friction does not increase as the water level increases. And so the flow, so the, so the flow ends up and ends up becoming faster downstream by the bayhead, and then additionally, also across the bay, there's there's um, there's a there's a very uh, low low friction as well. So this together ends up creating a drawdown effect that ends up happening on the system, uh, and then the transitional point uh, in the system is roughly at at uh, uh, bankful discharge. Uh, whereby it switches from a backwater system to a drawdown system. And uh, at this point, we also have peak scouring in the channel bed um, due to the peak velocity that occurs there at this point. So now if we want to think, think more conceptually about the, the river waves uh, moving downstream, and if we put uh, measured discharge on the x-axis here and lag time on the y-axis, well, for a traditional river, we would expect for uh, the lag time to decrease as discharge becomes larger. The, lar the fastest event is going to move downstream the fastest. And this is, this is traditionally what we assume um, in the coastal environment as well. However, uh, Along, along the coast in the fluvial marine transition, we end up having uh, a divergence uh, from this trend and the lag time dramatically increases and becomes much longer uh, in the system. Additionally, uh, when we think about 
uh, the actual discharge that's coming through downstream, like in the bay, uh, we, uh, we would usually assume that, that basically the, um, the trend is, is uh, quite linear and the measured discharge upstream basically represents the downstream discharge. However, this trend ends up diverging uh, as well. And so we end up having or not having a continual trend that follows there. And, and in this divergence, we end up having less flow downstream or downstream and uh, directly at the coast uh, than, uh, than what we would, would, would be measuring up um, inland. And so this is because uh, of the increased lag time and because of the storage uh, that occurs and the delta. So pulling this uh, together um, uh, a little bit more conceptually, we can think of the discharge flowing, flowing into the fluvial, the fluvial marine, marine transition. Uh, and the fluvial marine transition acts kind of like a sponge almost. Uh, so the widening channels, flattening bed slope, broad coastal floodplain, and the floodplain friction all act uh, to change this. Um, and this is all, all of these factors end up being different than what we would usually identify in a river uh, inland. And the wave itself or the discharge event uh, ends up uh, attenuating and it becomes slower. Uh, so we have a hammer there to represent it getting smaller and the turtle for it to get to, to move downstream slower. Uh, and so, so this, this also, it was not consistent uh, across the system spatially. So, so further inland, uh, the, 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 these effects were smaller by the rivers, way down by the bay, these effects were much larger. Uh, and then uh, in the delta, there was a quite, a, quite a bit of uh, variability in this that occurred. So the variability across the delta uh, can be broken down by thinking of it as flow, flow that's, that's uh, confined uh, to the channel. Uh, whereby it's small discharge and uh, the effects of the channel width and slope uh, are moderate. And this does cause some attenuation and some uh, slowdown of the wave. As discharge becomes larger and we have flooding th through the crevasses, uh, the floodplain ends up acting a lot more uh, um, on the system and it ends up uh, Ca causing these, these effects to become much larger. And, and, and it causes a gr much greater amount of attenuation and slowing down of the discharge events. Uh, then uh, lastly, when we have the over, over levee flooding that occurs, uh, the additional effects of the floodplain vegetation are, are a bit more minimal compared to the large increase uh, in, the, in the over levee flooding and so we do still have a fair amount of attenuation due to the friction, but the flow still can move downstream through the channels. And so we don't end up having as much of, of an effect on the lag time that ends up occurring uh, to the peak, the peak discharge downstream. So if we pull this together and think about the applications for, for uh, when to close uh, the, the, the fisheries, uh, we can use the inland discharge measurements and the wave theory to identify uh, the discharge timing and the magnitude. And uh, in this though, we, we need to uh, account for the spatial variability and the discharge variability that occurs. And so this is both the longitudinal, the vertical and the lateral changes that occur across the system. Uh, and then also unlike uh, traditional rivers uh, along the in, in these environments, the smallest discharge events are often the fastest. And so, and so this, this uh, could allow uh, the closures to possibly be uh, delayed for, for the larger events. Um, additionally, in thinking about the chemistry uh, of, of, of the fecal matter um, or the general pollution that's moving downstream, uh, as the discharge increases, the resonance time in the delta also increases, but in the bay, it ends up uh, decreasing due to the flushing of the system. Uh, so once again, this is um, a little bit different than what was previously thought. 
in conclusion, lastly, uh, we, we can identify that, uh, that, that uh, these uh, river flood waves do move through the coastal environment uh, all the way through a fluvial marine transition. And the timing and magnitude of the discharge is uh, nonlinear. Um, and these things change with uh, the, the, the channel width and slope, uh, broad floodplains, and uh, the floodplain vegetation. And lastly, uh, uh, with, 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 within even a single system, uh, these things, um, the, the timing and variability of the, of the discharge uh, can change uh, longitudinally and, and with the volume of discharge coming through the system. So thank you. All right, thanks, Steve, for, for this um, wonderful work. Um, I'm sure if Brian is here, but I assume he, he's you know, currently in a way. Um, but if anyone has any questions to ask uh, Steve, please um, you know, raise your hand or just, just uh, speak out or type into the chat window. Steve, thinking a little bit about that uh, difference in um, a possible delay. So do you think that's predictable? You'd mentioned that like a larger discharge might actually have a delay associated with that event, right? Yes. yes. So, so is that a predictable, is that something that would be predictable enough that a regulatory agency would be comfortable with um, potentially setting delays? Yes. Yes, I think absolutely. Um, the yeah, as, as, as long as uh, there's no major land changes that are occurring uh, um, along, along the fluvial marine transition, along that gradient, uh, I think it should be uh, fairly, fairly consistent. And in my observations, it is, it is quite uh, predictable across that. 